a really easy audience participation activity for you. I'm not so talented as to write a three-part harmony to have you sing, but I can, in fact, ask you by show of hands, and this should be really easy, raise your hand if you did not know, as of right now, that there have been a tremendous amount of social and political changes going on in Tunisia and Egypt. Just raise your hand. I didn't think I'd catch anybody, especially after some of the examples in some of the talks we've seen so far. But what I want to talk about today, and I've titled this deliberately provocatively, is what I call the tyranny of tolerance. And so when you think about what's been going on in Tunisia, in Egypt, we have a lot of conventional wisdom that we look to for how to actually interpret whether or not the movements that we've seen are actually going to have legs. And one of the emblems of this conventional wisdom is certainly Fareed Zakaria, writer for Time and a prominent media figure. And he actually argues that he thinks that what's gone on in Tunisia and in Egypt and in other parts that we necessar haven't necessarily heard about in the United States, like the Sudan, does actually have legs. And he argues that there are two specific things that give him faith that this will actually keep going. The first thing you've heard a lot about today, so I'm going to not talk about it technology. So he says the force of technology is one of the primary things that gives him hope that this will actually be something that lasts for longer than two or three years or turns back to another authoritarian dictator in Tunisia or Egypt. But the other thing which I am going to talk about today is what can only be called youth. So as you see here, youth in Egypt, youth in Tunisia, and what we've seen from these youths in Tunisia can only be called as a movement for freedom. So they've overturned various dictators, and what they are actually working towards is what I would call a question of political theory. So there's an opportunity here that goes beyond technology, that goes beyond the idea that simply by virtue of being young, they are genetically programmed to never make mistakes, and instead goes to a question of political theory, one that's as old as Aristotle, who we see here, and it really goes to the heart of the challenge that's now presented. So now that we've seen Mubarak step down, now that we've seen the transition begin towards democracy, and that question is, what constitutes a free democracy? Now, we've had centuries of research, and certainly Aristotle had his own ideas about what constitutes a free and fair democracy. But what I contend is that in the Middle East, in North Africa, there's a unique opportunity to really rethink democracy and to create what might be called our 21st century versions of democracy. One of the hearts of this question, of course, was emblematized in Tahrir Square. This idea that's very inspiring, welcome to freedom. And so what you see here is a really interesting kind of testimony to not the technology, not even necessarily the youth, but to the theoretical idea of freedom that goes and extends beyond just simply whether or not you are under the age of 25, and certainly extends beyond the reach of mere technology. And I use mere, of course, in quotations for this crowd. But when we talk about freedom, one of the challenges that's going to be faced in Tunisia and in uh, the rest of North Africa is that they're trying to develop democracy in a context of both persistent and pervasive inequality. And I think that one of the people who has had some level of success in actually transitioning, who we might look to for some ideas about what the future holds for Tunisia and Egypt, is actually someone who has done this before. And that would be Nelson Mandela. In his 1995 book, The Long Walk to Freedom, Mandela actually contended that what happened that moment when the authoritarian government stepped down, when the apartheid government agreed to share power, was not the ushering in of freedom, but instead was the right or the opportunity to actually think about how to implement freedom. And so there's a very subtle difference there that really makes a point when you're thinking about whether or not a demo democratic transition is actually going to last or persist beyond the heady moment of toppling the dictator or toppling the authoritarian government. 
And what he argues in terms of how we should think about freedom and how we should implement freedom in a 21st century democracy is that there are two aspects to freedom. The first is really embodied in that idea of tolerance, thus the name tyranny of tolerance. This idea that we need to live in a way that respects others' freedom. So I need to be okay with the idea that you might want to live differently than I do, whether it is for racial or cultural reasons, whether it's for religious reasons, whether or not there are different genders who would like to have different lives in some way, shape, or form. And what I want to argue is that in the 20th century, we really focused on the tolerance aspect. We really focused on the respect. But in the 21st century, particularly in contexts of persistent inequality, we should probably also think about that second half of what Mandela is talking about. Not just respecting the freedom of others, but actually making commitments to live in a way that enhances the freedom of others. That's the much harder challenge for the 21st century. We have, in fact, mastered tolerance. And I want to look a little bit at some data from the United States that shows the product of 50 years of emphasis on the idea of tolerance to kind of see where one of the pitfalls might lie going forward. So when we think about US millennials, when we think about young people in the United States, we know that they are very much like their North African counterparts in terms of their access and their usage of technology. And we also know that there are certain levels of tolerance that are very similar. But let's look a little bit deeper at the data and explore what I call the millennial puzzle. So what we found, and Pew has found this, the Pew Research Center has found this, the Center for Research on Civic Learning and Engagement has found this, is that young people are far more tolerant than their older counterparts, whether it's me as a Generation Xer, whether it's the baby boomers who are going to need us to pay for their health care and their social security, the younger people are far more tolerant. So we've done good. We've had 50 years of emphasis on tolerance, and we seem to have succeeded. But let's look a little bit at some data we collected in 2008. And I want to direct your attention to the yellow line. And look at how, when we look at a question about border security, how and whether we should increase border security on the United States, depending on the cause, terrorism or illegal immigration, and the location, millennials, in fact, at first, do seem far more tolerant. So we see older voters, wanting more border security, something that might restrict civil liberties, restrict freedom, whereas millennials seem to be more tolerant. But here's the puzzle piece. I'll direct your attention to the green line. When we did some chi-square analyses and other statistical tests, what we found was the practical impact of this, what seems to be a wide gap, is actually quite small. So if you look at that green line and you see on a scale of zero to one, where one would be this is super important and it will change the world, and zero would be it's not very significant, 0.114 is far closer to zero than it is to one. We also found that on one specific area, millennials are actually less tolerant than their older contingencies. So what do we do with this information? We have this puzzle, and we're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, one of the things that we do think is going on is that the questions, the kinds of questions that we're asking here are very much susceptible, and tolerance more generally is very much susceptible, as we learned from other presentations, to the emotion of fear. So when fear is generated, it becomes that much more difficult to actually extend those freedoms and enhance the freedoms as, of others, as Mandela would ask us to. And so what I would propose, instead of simply focusing on tolerance, as people in the Middle East and North Africa really start to think about the ways in which they might craft a 21st century democracy instead of a 20th century democracy, is to emphasize what I call deep political solidarity as a component and a companion to tolerance. Now, in terms of counteracting the fear, deep political solidarity focuses on cultivating an emotion of empathy. 
that would buttress solidarity against fear in a way that fear has not been able to be buttressed with regard to tolerance. Similarly, it actually changes the relationship between citizens. So rather than thinking of citizens as being static and having a static relationship, what ends up happening instead is that the relationship between citizens is changed. So what would I ask you to do? I would actually ask you to really do a very easy thing, as opposed to doing something hard like going on the internet on your iPhone. The really easy thing I would ask you to do going forward is to really think about the ways in which deep political solidarity is probably not something familiar to all of us, but it is in fact something that needs to actually be incorporated into 21st century democracies. Why? It's certainly not the fault of millennials that they are less tolerant on certain things than their older counterparts, because we've emphasized as a political culture tolerance so much. So I would encourage you to think about how we can actually rethink and expand our thinking to include deep political solidarity. So I'm actually asking you to not use technology and to actually use your brains and to perhaps experiment with the ways in which we could cultivate deep political solidarity.